What do you think happens after we die? Do you think there's an afterlife? Or do we simply rot underground, becoming the latest development in the world of worm real estate? Do we hover about in a void of nothingness? Or do we return to the world of the living in a completely different form? Or perhaps none of this is even real. Perhaps we're in a simulation. Maybe this is all just one big game. I don't mean to spark an existential crisis, but it's a possibility we cannot ignore. The more I think about it, the more I can link the concept of the afterlife to the Banjo-Kazooie series. It covers a surprising amount of ground. Banjo-Kazooie was like heaven. It filled me with joy and happiness, and I would have gladly spent the rest of eternity within its charming atmosphere. Banjo-Tooie was like hell. It was vast and empty, void of any fun or delight, and I would have hated spending even an extra second in that dead of misery, let alone an eternity. But what of the third game, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts? While its overarching theme represents the possibility of us being in a game of some kind, I also think it represents reincarnation. It is Banjo-Kazooie reborn in a completely different way. The question is, is this reincarnation of the bear and bird closer to heaven or hell? Let's kill ourselves and find out! Look, I can see that that was a pretty strange way of introducing the topic, but it's hard, okay? If you think it's so easy coming up with creative and interesting ways to kick off every new video like this, you fucking try it. Anyway, Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts, let's crack on. I want to start with a confession. No, I haven't groomed a child. I just want to say that this is not my first time playing Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts. I've played it before, I used to play it a lot when I was younger. It was my first Banjo-Kazooie game, and I played it quite a long time before the other games, so I'm familiar with it. I never beat it, but I know exactly what I'm getting into. There won't be any big surprises for me. It has been a long time though, and I am curious to see how well it holds up in reality when compared to how I remember it. Let's just start at the beginning. The events of this game take place sometime after the end of Banjo-Tooie, which I never saw because... Well, let's not go there. I think I've said quite enough about that game. I can't be making the fans angry this early, can I? Gruntilda the Witch, now just a skull, erupts from a grave of rubble and hunts down Banjo and Kazooie who are now obese, which I'll be honest, is a very disturbing sight. The Bear and Bird duo, now larger than ever, and Gruntilda, now simply a head, encounter each other and are about to launch him to what could have been the most pitiful and pathetic hero villain showdown of all time, when they are suddenly interrupted by the Lord of Games, or Log for short. Log is the creator of all video games, and forces Banjo and Kazooie to face off against Gruntilda in a competition. The winner may lay claim to Spiral Mountain, while the loser will be forced to work in Log's video game factory. It's definitely a unique plot premise, but it doesn't really matter since there's basically no narrative in the game whatsoever. It's just a simple excuse to bring these characters back and give them something to do. It is nice to see them on more modern hardware and far less polygonal than they were previously. Banjo looks great, Kazooie looks slightly off, Grunty looks fine I suppose, the other supporting characters look like smoother versions of themselves, and Trophy Tom? Mmm, mmm, Papa's hungry! But I will say that the overall visuals of the game lack the charm this series is known for. The whole approach to the visuals is really strange. Each area is supposed to be a video game, so everything is intentionally made to look fake, but things like water and grass can still look strangely hyper-realistic. It's a very weird looking game. But I wouldn't call it ugly, it's just... odd. And also, the lack of every inanimate object having googly eyes and talking to you really saddens me for some reason. But it's no big deal. It looks fine and the music is pretty good too, so I'm not going to complain too much. The big deal here is the gameplay. To fans of Zooey and Tooey who saw this game for the first time, the gameplay would come as a bit of a shock. Nuts and Bolts is not about exploring levels in search of collectibles in a traditional platforming manner. Instead, Nuts and Bolts is all about completing vehicle-based challenges. For me, that experience was the reverse. I played Nuts and Bolts first, so going back to see that the early games weren't even remotely about vehicles was a shock to me. Weird, hey? That's not to say that the old ways were completely abandoned. Much like how there are still people out there who beat their kids, Nuts and Bolts still clings to the tradition of having collectibles be the main driving force of progress. Notes and Jiggies return, as do the Jinjos, as well as some new collectibles that I'll get into. What's changed is how you earn them, and the role that they play within the game. 
Like I've said, Nuts and Bolts swaps out the classic platforming in exchange for vehicle-centric gameplay. Many would retch at the thought of this, and admittedly, I do think it sounds like a really shit idea. I mean, so many games are played with shitty vehicles that tarnish their reputation and leave a bad taste in our mouths. To have a game that is based solely around the idea of using vehicles sounds like a war crime. But it's like I always say, don't knock it till you try it. I actually never say that. I'm terrified of trying new things because what if I get hurt? But you know, with this, what's the worst that could happen? Your goal in Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is to venture to levels and complete vehicle-based challenges to earn rewards. For simply attempting the challenge, you earn notes. For completing it reasonably well, you earn a jiggy. And for completing it exceptionally well, you earn a Trophy Tom Trophy. For every four Trophy Tom Trophies you win, you earn a bonus jiggy. This is actually a great setup. Each reward provides different benefits. Notes have a variety of uses in Showdown Town, the hub world, which I'll explain later. Jiggies grant access to new levels, and the trophies, with the allure of a potential bonus jiggy, incentivize actually trying to perform well in the challenges. Now that's all well and good, but what about the challenges themselves? Well, to be honest, the first level, Nutty Acres Act 1, was not a very strong opening. It was a simple drive to a specific location mission with a predetermined vehicle. Very basic, and not very exciting. It was a pretty weak start. A lot of the earlier missions are like that actually, very simple things like races or fetch quests involving fairly ordinary vehicles that are chosen for you. I was worried that the whole game was going to be like this and would end up being extremely boring. But it turns out that the further in you go, the more elaborate and more difficult the missions become, and it becomes a lot less about using vehicles made for you and more about making your own vehicles to complete these challenges. And that is key. It always infuriates me when games have a shitload of awful vehicles that control badly or are incredibly boring or pop up too often. It usually makes the game so much less fun to play. With that in mind, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is fucking awesome. I genuinely think it's brilliant. The thing that sets this game apart from other platformers with vehicles in them is that the main idea behind Nuts and Bolts is that you have the freedom to create your own vehicles. And you have a lot of freedom. In the early stages of the game you are quite restricted with what vehicle parts you have available to you, but as you progress you gain access to quite a lot of vehicle parts. You can buy them using notes in Showdown Town, you earn some as your jiggy total increases, you can earn more parts by bringing crates to Mumbo in Showdown Town. It doesn't take long for you to amass an impressive catalogue of vehicle parts. You can use these parts to create literally whatever you want to tackle these challenges with. Sometimes you are forced to partake in a Logs Choice mission, where you're only allowed to use the vehicle the game provides you, but most of the time you get to create and use your own, and I just think that's amazing. Early on, you don't really need to make your own vehicles, as the basic trolley can pretty much do anything you need at that point, and if that's not the case, a slight modification to it, like adding wings or a weapon, will usually get the job done, because they're simple missions like races or fetch quests or escort missions. But like I said, things get more elaborate and intricate as you progress and that requires you to get creative. The first mission I remember giving me a bit of trouble was Make Them Wait in Logbox 720 Act 4. This mission required you to press a number of buttons by parking a heavy vehicle on it. The mission provides you with giant metal letters to help weigh down your vehicle, so I thought it would be a pretty easy win to just fly around and complete the mission with the Kazooie Bomber, which is the vehicle that I would made for a previous mission. But it turns out that my Kazooie Bomber struggled to hold more than two metal letters at a time while in the air meaning at the final button, I wouldn't be heavy enough to press it down and succeed. So, I had to get creative. I went to Mumbo's Motors and racked my brain to try and come up with a solution. I needed a vehicle that would be able to fly around the level with ease, since Logbox 720 is a level with a lot going on. I also needed the vehicle to have a flat surface that I could attach the letters to without them falling off. And that's how I came up with the Banjo Saucer. This was the first time I made a vehicle specifically to handle a single mission, and it worked. It wasn't smooth and it was quite a slow moving vehicle, but it worked as I intended. The Banjo Saucer was able to fly steadily, and I was able to attach the metal letters to its flat underside, meaning I had no trouble weighing down the buttons. And that rush, that feeling that I got after watching my idea succeed, was amazing! Not many games can make me feel like I've genuinely achieved something, but this mission managed it. And the Banjo Saucer was the first of many highlights for me. There were quite a few missions that presented me with a problem that none of my pre-existing vehicles could handle, which meant I had to come up with a new vehicle to solve it. 
Nadiaka's Act 5 was a good example of this. It had a handful of missions where I needed to design a brand new vehicle to succeed. The first of these was the mission Save Our Statue. In this mission, you need to defend the statue from Gruntilda's Gruntbots, who are attacking the statue from the air. My initial idea was to use my Kazooie Bomber and take the fight to them in the sky, but that proved to be a bit difficult since there were so many of them. So my next idea was to build a vehicle that could take the statue away from the Gruntbots so they couldn't attack it. I ended up coming up with a flying fortress, which is basically a big cage with air balloons attached. The idea was to load the statue into the flying fortress and lift it high up into the sky. That ended up being a stupid idea since it made it a lot easier for the Grumbots to attack it. But being on the defensive did end up being more successful than the aggressive approach. And that's when inspiration hit. I don't actually need to move the statue, all I need to do is block the Grumbots attacks. And so, I came up with the silo. The silo was essentially just a massive rectangular tube, and the idea was to just park it over the statue so the Gruntbots couldn't get to it. And it worked like a charm. The only damage the statue took was from the silo landing on it. Beyond that, the Gruntbots couldn't touch it. This was another one of those moments where I was so incredibly pleased with my clever solution. I was genuinely giddy. The game presented me with a problem, and I outsmarted it. After a few failed attempts, of course. The Flying Fortress, after its pathetic debut, did make a comeback in Klungo's Omelette mission, and a bigger variation of it was very handy in Mr. Fit's Coconut mission. I absolutely loved coming up with vehicles to solve these problems, and I was genuinely happy when I witnessed my ideas succeeding. But my absolute favourite was my solution to the Jiggy in Jigaseum Act 5. Every so often you'll have a level dedicated to a single mission against Gruntilda, and completing it will reward you with a useful vehicle part that you can use not only in your own vehicles, but also in Showdown Town. Jigaseum Act 5 is one of them, and I spent over an hour trying to solve this one. The challenge here is Gruntilda is trying to destroy 9 balls in the arena, and your job is to make sure she doesn't until the time runs out. If at least 5 balls remain, you win. But if Grunty destroys too many of your balls with her laser, not only will you not be able to have kids anymore, but you'll also lose the game. I tried so many things. My initial idea was to bring back the Flying Fortress and carry my balls away where Grunty couldn't get to them. But her laser was too strong and my balls got annihilated. I then tried to use my Kazooie Bomber to blow Grunty's vehicle to bits, but that wasn't very effective either. Next, I called upon the Silo. I thought the same strategy I used for the statue would also work for my balls, but it was too slow and too narrow to actually protect them. After that, I attempted to use the Jaws of Captivity, which was a dud vehicle I used for a sheep herding mission earlier on in the game. It worked briefly and managed to stop Grunty in her tracks, until she started to fly. My balls had no chance after that. But it was the most effective solution so far, and it did spark inspiration. So, I devised the Rat Catcher. This vehicle was a small helicopter that carried a giant box that would work in a similar way to the silo. Connected by a detacher, the plan was to fly over Grunty and detach the cage, landing on Grunty and preventing her from moving and blasting my balls. It seemed like a good idea and it also worked briefly, but what I didn't realise is that if Grunty is unable to move, the game despawns her and respawns her, meaning the rat catcher was effectively only stalling Grunty slightly. It was also very slow and dependent on my own depth perception, which wasn't consistent. Once again, my balls were destroyed. I was struggling. I had ideas, but I wasn't sure how to make them work. The Jaws of Captivity worked briefly, but wasn't able to stop Grunty from taking to the air. The Rat Catcher also worked briefly, but it trapped Grunty too well, meaning she couldn't move, forcing her to respawn and escape. I needed a vehicle that would be able to catch Grunty, but also keep her moving. And that's when I came up with my proudest creation, the Scoop Trap. What this vehicle essentially was, was the Flying Fortress turned on its side. The idea? To scoop up Grunty into the cage, then activate the balloon so the vehicle would lift up 90 degrees, trapping Grunty and lifting her towards the ceiling. In a pinch, it would also be able to lift my balls out of danger. It wasn't perfect, and there was room for improvement, but it worked, and I was so fucking happy. It was a tough challenge, but with enough experimenting, I managed to come up with an effective, and somewhat amusing, solution. And that, honestly, is the magic of this game. In pretty much every other game in the universe, you are given a problem and you are given an answer, you just have to do it. 
But here in Nuts and Bolts, you are given a problem, but most of the time you are not given an answer. What you're given is a wide range of vehicle parts, and the freedom to assemble them however you want, with the only limit being your imagination. You can come up with things like the banjo saucer, the silo, and the scoop trap. You can go wild with the tools available to you. In this game, you create your own solutions, and that's so fucking cool. I absolutely love that. It means there are limitless ways you can complete a challenge. And even when the game forces you to use a pre-made vehicle, it usually has some fun quirk that can teach you something about a vehicle part that might come in handy for you later. The world of Nuts and Bolts is basically a colourful vehicle-based playground. I came up with some pretty goofy solutions to some problems, and it was a blast! The feeling of being presented with a task, coming up with a creative and weird solution, and seeing that solution work is unmatched. Some might complain that controlling the vehicles isn't fun, but that's the thing, you make the vehicles in this game. If you're piloting a vehicle that controls badly or isn't fun to use, it's your fault! You designed it! You can't blame the game for that, you're the one who put it together, just make a better vehicle you wanker! And if you're not the type of person who wants to spend time in Mumbo's Motors designing vehicles, you do have the option to buy vehicle blueprints in Showdown Town using the notes you've collected. I'm not sure if it's possible to beat the game using only these vehicles, I was too entranced by the prospect of creating my own, but they're available to you if that's more your style. But if that's how you decide to play the game, you're a loser, you're missing out on the good stuff. But of course, as with every game, it isn't perfect. If it was perfect, the gaming industry would have shut down, because it would have peaked here with nuts and bolts. Why bother continuing when it doesn't get better than this? Why try? We would all just play this game and then walk into the sea. Starting a new life beneath the waves, returning to the ocean-dwelling species we once were, to start over because humanity reached its highest height. That didn't happen. Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts does have a few flaws that I want to address. If the internet has taught me anything, it's that all humans only want to complain about things, even the things that don't matter. Firstly, there are a lot of recycled and similar objectives. They each have their differences, but there are a lot of races, a lot of carrying an object from point A to point B, just a lot of very similar challenges. They are fun and each put their own spin on it, and they do get more elaborate and interesting as the game goes on, but a bit more variety across the board would be nice. That can also be applied to the levels themselves. The levels in this game are handled very differently to previous Banjo-Kazooie games. Each level, rather than being a single entity, is divided into separate acts that take place in the same location. This makes what would have been very busy and crowded levels more manageable, as it turns them into smaller bite-sized chunks, with only a handful of challenges per act, instead of having all of them there at the same time. And while I approve of that, there aren't actually that many levels. There are only five levels in the game, six if you count the finale in Spyro Mountain, but that's only one act. The other levels have six acts, except for Terrarium of Terror, which has five. And that's nice and all, but personally, I would have preferred it if there were more levels with fewer acts. Like, say instead of five levels with six acts each, we had ten levels with three acts each. That would allow for a lot more variety, I think. It could have even led to some new objectives. But it's a bit late for that now, it was just an innocent little suggestion. The only other level in the game is Showdown Town, which is the hub world, and honestly, I find it kind of annoying. It's a nice place and I'd be happy to move in, but it has some issues. I really don't like having to take the jiggies you earn to the bank in the middle of town. Any other game would simply add the jiggy to your total the moment you earn it. I don't understand the need for an extra step. I especially don't understand the need for cops who try and prevent you from taking your jiggies to the bank. Like, why? Why are we making this already annoying thing even more annoying? Are Jiggies contraband in Showdown Town? Are they used to smuggle drugs, embezzle funds, steal precious data, warn to let citizens know that you're a prostitute? If that's true, then why are there Jiggy dispensers all over the place? Then you've got the countless civilians. Honestly, you cannot drive for more than three seconds without hitting a rhino or a pig, which then responds with some witty one-liner about ten seconds after you hit them. It's almost like Showdown Town is a giant zoo that got out of control. Then there are just some things that are almost completely unnecessary, like Boggy's Gym, for example. I don't know why you would spend notes to upgrade Banjo's speed, strength, and stamina when you're in a vehicle 99.9% .9 of the time. That remaining 0.1% is literally just when Banjo gets out of the vehicle to speak to an NPC. 
Why would you spend hundreds of notes on that when you could be buying a fucking laser? Who's sitting there thinking, yeah, a weapon of mass destruction would be nice, but I also like the idea of buying a gym membership. You idiots. The Jinjos are also a bit of a waste. When you find them in a level, they have a very basic objective with a prize that I don't really understand. Is it bingo? It doesn't look like any bingo I've played. I've never even played bingo before, but I just know instinctively that this is not bingo. I never could really be bothered to figure out what this was, so I ignored the Jinjos for most of the game. And lastly, I did notice some performance issues, things like worryingly long load times, frame drops and stutters, that sort of thing. I don't want to say that it's an innate issue with the game, it could be that my copy of the game is slow from the wear and tear of its usage. It could be because of my Logbox 720 being as old and worn as it is. It could be the beginning of some sort of eye condition that I have. I don't know, it could be anything. I just wanted to point out that it happened to me, and I don't want to look like a fool for not mentioning it if it was a universal experience. Fitting in is fucking hard, okay? I'm trying my best! So, I think the time has come to address the elephant in the room. I've made it pretty clear that I really like this game. I think it's loads of fun, it has a great concept, and I honestly wish there were more games like it. Tears of the Kingdom is the closest the industry has come, and that's basically it. Seeing Banjo in his adorable little suit after finishing the game made me wish I could keep playing. But it's also when I realised that this was supposed to be a Banjo-Kazooie game. The whole time I was playing the game, I was enjoying myself to the point where I completely forgot it was even supposed to be a Banjo-Kazooie game. And that's where I imagine this game is controversial among Fanjos. That's what I've decided to call Banjo fans. Fanjos. I love this game and I think it's brilliant, but as a Banjo-Kazooie game... It's quite shit. Any focus on platforming or collecting or exploring charming worlds was almost completely obliterated by the shift in focus to vehicles. And if the Fanjos have a problem with this game, I'm almost certain that that's the reason. Because it isn't anything like Zooey and Tui. I despise Tui, but even I have to admit that it's a better Banjo-Kazooie game than Nuts and Bolts, simply because it's the right genre. Nuts and Bolts is completely different. I reckon that if Nuts and Bolts was a completely original IP and was in no way related to Banjo-Kazooie, it would have been more widely adored. But obviously that's not the reality we're in. I think that sums up my stance on Nuts and Bolts quite well. As a Banjo-Kazooie game, Nuts and Bolts is very disappointing since it isn't anywhere near what a Banjo-Kazooie game is meant to be. But I'm not a hardcore Fanjo, so I'm more than happy to set that aside and look at the game in isolation. To me, Nuts and Bolts is a fantastic game that puts your creativity and ingenuity to the test in a way no other game I've played has been able to do, and with that comes a very unique flavour of fun and sense of achievement. I genuinely think it's brilliant, and while it may be lacking in some areas, its gameplay more than makes up for it. My original goal was to determine what kind of afterlife Nuts and Bolts would be. I would say, like in real life, it depends on the person. For the Fanjos, I imagine this game is hell, like Banjo-Tooie was for me. But for me, Nuts and Bolts is not only a reincarnation, but also a very special kind of heaven. Cheers God, you've made me very very happy. My Nuts and Bolts have never been so erect.